Controversy continues to swirl in the wake of President Obama's speech on the Middle East last week. In the speech, the president called for resumption of peace talks based on 1967 borders with certain land swaps to accommodate major Israeli population centers. Where do we go from here? We'll talk about it today on Politics and Religion. Look, there are two things I don't discuss, politics and religion. In my house, we don't talk about politics and we don't talk about religion. I'll talk to you about anything except politics and religion. I never talk about politics and religion. Politics determines how we'll live here on Earth. Religion determines how we'll live forever. I'm Irvin Baxter. I think it's time we talk about it. Well, events continue to progress in the Middle East in particular, and the reason this is so important, of course, uh, there are two major prophetic fulfillments that still lurk in the future, and each of those will be two of the top six or seven prophetic fulfillments in the last 2,000 years. Now think about it, 2,000 years, and yet we are facing any time now two of the top six or seven over a 2,000-year period. Now I'm talking about since the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Start there. Now name the major prophetic fulfillments since that time. What are we talking about? Probably, number one, the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 AD and the driving of Jews into exile around the world for the next 1,878 years. That was a big prophetic event. Jesus himself gave the prophecy. He said, not one stone will be left upon another. Your house will be left to you desolate. Well, that happened. 1,878 years desolate. The Jewish people scattered throughout the nations. Why? Because they rejected their Messiah. A huge transgression. Uh, Almighty God paid the ultimate price to save his people. And they looked at him and said, no, thank you. We don't believe in you. You don't fit our image of what we wanted in a Messiah. And therefore, uh, we believe you are an imposter. So that was number one prophetic fulfillment. Number two, I would say, would be the birth of the Holy Roman Empire in 800 A.D. That's when Pope Leo III put the crown on the head of Charlemagne and said, I now crown you emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. This was the birth of the feet of iron mingled with clay in the prophecy of Daniel chapter number 2, verse 31 through 45, uh, that's the the prophecy of the birth or of the of the Holy Roman Empire of the union of church and state that ruled Europe for the next 1,000 years, and the Bible says will ultimately produce the Antichrist and the false prophet. We've just seen the rebirth of the Holy Roman Empire on November the third of uh, 2009. Now that would probably be well, that's not number three. Let's say number three is the rebirth of the nation of Israel as a state in 1948. So that would be number three. And then number four, now we're getting into some tough territory here. I would say number four would probably be World War II under the second trumpet, the killing of 52 million people. That's a huge prophetic fulfillment. So let's say that's number four. Um, Chernobyl is a big one, but probably not as big as some of these others. And so let's sort of skip that. And uh, I would say that the rebirth of the Holy Roman Empire in uh, on November the 3rd of 2009 is probably number five and then number six will either be the rebirth of the um, the war of uh, Revelation chapter number nine World War three that's going to kill one third of mankind that's going to be absolutely huge and then uh, also the confirmation of the covenant which will be the peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians so you can see when we're looking at the big picture over the last 2,000 years and you have 
the potential of this war that must emanate from the Euphrates River area with all of the uh, controversy swirling in the Middle East right now, all the revolutions sweeping through the Middle East, and also uh, when you have the uh, possibility of all these other things occurring, uh, you just simply have to say that uh, we're in very prophetic territory. And that's the reason that we discuss often the Middle East and what this is really all about. Okay, so uh, let's review because President Obama had announced way ahead of time I'm going to be giving a speech on the Middle East. And uh, when, the United, when the President of the United States speaks, uh, you obviously... Uh, have to realize the United States is still the most powerful nation on earth, no matter whether you like that or hate that, it's still the absolute truth. And whenever uh, President Obama speaks, it be it has weight like no other single voice on the planet right now. So uh, when he made his speech on last Thursday, uh, one of the first things I noticed when he ar- addressed in particular the nation of Israel, he talked about the resumption of peace talks based on 1967 borders. Now, when he said that, that was like scraping your fingernails across a chalkboard to Israelis uh, because the Arab initiative that was put forth in 2002 insisted on, if you will withdraw to 1967 borders, that all of the Arab League will make peace with you. Well, Israel cannot withdraw 267 borders for two reasons. Number one, they are indefensible. It leaves Israel nine miles wide at the waist. When you talk about a jet airplane, uh, right now Israel is 44 miles wide at the waist from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, That takes a jet airplane about four minutes to transcend. How long does it take a jet airplane to cross nine miles wide? I mean, we're talking about what? Less than one minute, uh, it's just done. So uh, these borders are absolutely indefensible. If Israel would, in fact, agree to return to 1967 borders, that means rockets from Hamas and Fatah. Don't forget now, uh, Fatah and Hamas have now recently reunited. They're now one, and they're planning on uh, putting together a unity government within the next uh, few days, and they're planning on a, a new election that will have neither Fatah nor Hamas in it, a new election that will uh, bring back a united Palestinian front. The same people, the very same people that have been launching rockets into southern Israel now will be able to move those rockets up to East Jerusalem, right to the borders of the capital of Israel, within striking distance of the Knesset. Can you imagine Uh, 500 rockets raining down on the Knesset when all the leaders of Israel are in session in the Knesset. I mean, that's one of the possible scenarios. They also will be very close to Ben-Gurion Airport, which is the only place you fly in uh, international flights into in the nation of Israel. Uh, Think about the endangerment of all the flights coming in and the choking off of Uh, Tourism in Israel, tourism is absolutely essential to the lifeblood of Israel. So consequently, I mean, the ramifications are just simply on and on and on and on. So when President Obama said 1967 borders, this produced an uh, an immediate reaction from most quarters in the nation of Israel. Now, stop just a moment, because President Obama did say 1967 borders with land swaps to allow for population centers that now exist uh, within the territories controlled by Arabs in the uh, pre-1967 territories. So uh, he did make an allowance for land swaps. Now let's be totally candid about this whole thing. There have been two administrations that have pretty much proposed what President Obama proposed in his speech last Thursday. Uh, Mr. Ehud Barak, who was the prime minister back in the year 2000, He met with Yasser Arafat and with Bill Clinton for two weeks. They thought they were going to come away with a deal. Well, at the last minute, everything collapsed over the final status of the Temple Mount. However, uh, I think that the uh, very things that President Obama proposed on Thursday were pretty much what Barack and Yasser Arafat had agreed to back then. 
Well, then Ehud Omer, back in 2006, he also was working in agreement, and they he was forced out of office by um, charges of corruption, and he's still in the middle of that trial. Uh, but before he was forced out of office, both sides said we would have had peace within uh, a few weeks if Omer had not been forced out of office. Now, again, remember there's a God factor here. Does God push these people out of office? It looked like Ariel Sharon was driving toward a peace deal, that he and George Bush had already determined what Middle East peace would look like, and he had a letter from George Bush saying, if you will withdraw from Gaza, we will recognize that you don't have to withdraw totally to uh, pre-1967 borders. So on and on and on and on it went. Uh, That's part of what we're dealing with here. Uh, when we're dealing with all this. Now, let's get to the end game, because prophecy gives us what everything's going to look like. Uh, When you skip to the end game, you know that the Temple Mount is going to be placed under a sharing arrangement, and President Obama mentioned Jerusalem and the negotiation of Jerusalem as part of the final talks. He also came out against the Palestinians asking the United Nations to unilaterally declare a Palestinian state in pre-1967 borders. So uh, even though there was quite a, an outcry in Israel, which there really should have been, but it wasn't really an outcry coming from Prime Minister Netanyahu because he met with uh, Barack Obama the day after And even though he said we cannot return to pre-1967 borders, Netanyahu himself has endorsed two states living side by side. And in his speech, President Obama did say there should be a Jewish state for Jews and a Palestinian state for Palestinians. Well, so far the Palestinians have been unwilling to agree to a Jewish state and to acknowledge it will be a Jewish state. Now, it doesn't really matter because... Once they make a peace agreement with the nation of Israel, then Israel will control its internal policies. However, the Palestinians have been been very quick to say, when you say there will be a Jewish state, that's racist, because that means all the Arabs living inside of Israel will be second-class citizens. And so the complexity of this whole situation simply goes on and on and on and on. But in the end game, and there is going to be an end game, the Bible prophesies that there will be a deal signed It's called the Confirmation of the Covenant in Scriptures, and it's referring to the Abrahamic Covenant that God made with Abraham 4,000 years ago. He said, I will give you this land for you and your descendants after you forever. So the Antichrist, when he comes, will confirm the covenant. Everybody's going to say, this is wonderful. Well, guess what? It's not going to be wonderful because they're not confirming the covenant. They're only confirming Israel's right to exist, but they're also doing it within very... Uh, limited borders, and they are indefensible borders. Ultimately, the indefensibility of those borders is going to be brought to light when the world community invades Israel at the time of the Battle of Armageddon. So what what is Obama arguing with Benjamin Netanyahu in private? When Netanyahu says these borders are indefensible, Obama looks and says, look, you've got the defense of the whole world behind you. If we reach this agreement, then the international community is not going to allow anything. We're going to make sure that you are secure. Well, Netanyahu doesn't want to be at the mercy of the United Nations because that's not a very comfortable place to be. Uh, nevertheless, it looks like that's where Israel's going, and it's not going to work. It's going to lead the Battle of Armageddon. We're taking your calls in the program today. If you'd like to be on the air with us, 877-END-TIME is the number to call. End Time Ministries presents End of the Age, a 30-minute commercial-free TV show hosted by Irvin Baxter. Every Monday, End of the Age airs on the Church Channel at 9 p.m., Daystar at 10 p.m., and on TBN every Wednesday morning at 7 a.m., all Central Standard Time. On End of the Age, Irvin depicts how modern issues like an establishment of a one-world government, the religion of Islam, a coming World War III, and more line up so clearly with Bible prophecies written over 2,000 years ago. To get tomorrow's news today, be sure to tune into End of the Age every Monday on the Church Channel at 9 p.m., Daystar at 10 p.m., and on TBN every Wednesday morning at 7 a.m., all Central Standard Time. 
Visit endtime.com for more details or call us at 1 800 endtime. That's 1 800 363 8463. The Bible prophesies about four great spirits which control the